Hi there, I'm Lori McNee with Fine Art Tips and the 2020 Club, where creative entrepreneurs meet about art, social, and tech. I had just had a wonderful conversation with one of my personal art heroes, Sherry McGraw. Sherry McGraw was a student and became an instructor at the Art Students League of New York. She now is one of America's foremost artists and teachers. McGraw's successful book, The Language of Drawing, has garnered worldwide attention and is available at the Metropolitan Museum of Art Bookstore. Her sensitivity to the abstract beauty of a painting is her ultimate goal. She has received numerous awards and her work has been shown in major art institutions and museums around the country and the world. We had a great discussion about art and what it takes to become a professional artist. She is a very talented woman. She has a poetic mind and her paintings are lyrical and beautiful. You're going to enjoy learning how she went from being a little girl who wanted to be an artist to becoming one of the most masterful artists in our time. Thank you so much for joining us and please enjoy my interview with Sherry McGraw. Hi, Sherry. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi, Lori. I, uh, you, you came highly recommended by Joanne Manji, so I, I, I knew oh, that so this would be a nice interview. Well, thank you. It's great to have you here, and I've just been a big fan of yours for many years. And I would love to start by asking, how did you start out in this brilliant career that you have? Were you born knowing you wanted to be an artist? How did it all begin? Well. In, in one sense, I, I get, I think I was born kind of knowing it. I mean, I, I remember something happened at age about three and a half or three. Oh, wow. I was, I know, I know. I was uh, with my grandparents down in Texas and it was um, a gorgeous morning. And I was standing at the end of the driveway, looking across at this field of corn. It was early morning and it was so beautiful and I was captivated by the visual beauty of it. And at the same time, I was hearing my granny tell me that she was gonna take a switch to me if I didn't get out of the driveway, you know, out of, well, I guess she thought I was in the road and kind of in a dangerous place. And I just remember, you know, consciously thinking that it was worth any kind of whipping that I would get just to experience that beauty. You know, so I just was visually so awestruck by what I was seeing. It was kind of like seeing, you know, the light, the air, the color, everything. It, it just was so alive to me. And so maybe that was the first time that I was maybe really conscious of it. But then it was when I was four that I made some really big decisions in my life. Oh, that's so, you know, I come from a big family, so I'm one of seven kids. Where do you fall in the lineup? I, I'm the third. third okay. from, so yeah. a middle child. <laughs> I'm a middle, middle child. Me and my, my sister Sandy are both kind of middle kids. And I, I remember going with my mom to a friend of hers house. And they, you know, my mom was a really talented bridge player. And she would, you know, they would recount the tournament they had from the night before or whatever and the cards and hands and all of that anyway and I love to just sit and listen and watch this and I remember it was that morning because for some reason she only took me over there and I remember it was that morning I thought you know I'm not going to get married I'm not going to have kids and I'm going to be an artist that's incredible <laughs> Well, it was a strange thing, but for some reason, at age four, I was so resolute. In Oklahoma, it started at such a young age where girls were thinking about getting married. And certainly, if you were more than age 21 and you weren't married, there was something really wrong with you, <laughs> you know. And of course, it's such a different time today. But I just remember feeling that if I didn't kind of steal myself early, and decide what I was gonna do, I'd never get out of there. That's such a mature way of looking at the world at four years old, that, that is mind boggling to me. <laughs> and, and you were struck by the landscape, and did you, I mean, how'd you even know what being an artist was at that point? It kind of reminds me of what Van Gogh felt when he saw those fields, you know, when you're explaining it, that same passion. Uh, did you start painting or drawing with crayons or what happened from there? 
Well, I mean, I don't remember not drawing, so okay. you know, it was something I always did. Painting started a little bit later, you know, when I was in junior high, you know, but I always drew. You know, my mom had art books, uh, this whole art book series from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so I, I just, that was my entertainment. I would just, you know, hours look through all the different books. And the ones that I, I mean, the earliest painting that I remember being struck by was El Greco, you know, the view of Toledo. Yeah. Do you know that one? I do. And I think that it spoke to some sort of passion or something, you know. Um, and I just remember being so moved by that painting. Um, so I think it was looking at old, you know, at art books about, you know, uh, paintings, artists. And also she had a, a book of old, um, uh, old master Italian drawings. Um, when I was babysitting kids, you know, once I'd get them to bed, then I would take out my pencil paper, the book, and I would copy these drawings. So that was like my like fun thing to do. So I think it just was kind of with me and, and I really am grateful to my mom for having those books available because well, it, it showed me, I mean, I didn't even really know what a fine artist was, but I, you know, I just knew I wanted to be one. And was she supportive once you started to show artistic interest and talent? Completely, in, in a very kind of understated, quiet way. But yeah. you know, she was just completely supportive of it. You know, you know, she didn't really want to have seven kids, but she was Catholic and ended up having seven kids. <laughs> and I think that her, in her heart, she would have been some sort of a, probably a writer or an actress you know, but in the arts. And I think that it was so exciting to her that she had a child that seemed to have this bent. So she, yeah, she nurtured it from the beginning. Oh, that's beautiful. So you mentioned one of your heroes as a young child, and then fast forward a little bit older, you make the transition from somebody that's hoping to be an artist to actually becoming one. And how did that happen? Well, um, a little bit circuitously. Um, I mean, you know, I was doing watercolor. I, I did that famous artist course, or at least started it. Um, you know, and I figured the way to become an artist was to go to school. So I found a, a college, an, an arts college down in a small town in Oklahoma, Chickasha, Oklahoma, if you can imagine, <laughs> and uh, uh, Oklahoma College of Liberal Arts, and it, it was it was really kind of an unusual place because where most universities and I and I visited a few to find out what I was looking for, and I wanted traditional skills, so I started out there, uh, and then the next year, I mean, they fired all my favorite teachers, so I went to a different college in Oklahoma the next year, and what I was finding was that I was uh, an A student. I was you know making A's in all my art classes. But I knew I wasn't learning anything. It was actually then that this uh, mentor from uh, my little town I grew up in, Ponca City, grew up, um, who was a good still life painter, E.L. Mount. And so he suggested that I study with a couple in Oklahoma City, Richard and Edith Getz. So that's all I had to hear. And so I quit school and I went there to study with them, is actually okay, what so happened. Originally, you were inspired by landscape, and then you started to be intrigued by still life at, at this point. Is, is that what happened? You know, I actually had no subject matter in my head at all. Okay. I, I just wanted to be an artist, so that's kind of all I knew. But when I was in college, I was getting, you know, straight A's, but I wasn't learning anything. All I was doing was doing what the teacher wanted, and that, that I had learned. I learned those days well. myself. <laughs> It's very yeah. frustrating. I mean, you, it, there's really no such thing as self-taught, but you definitely have to steer yourself in the right direction to find the right mentors and the right education, even if it's through books or videos or, or whatever. It sounds like you had that passion that helped drive you in the right directions. Well, it, it was a stepping stone. I mean, I, they were uh, teaching Impressionism and you know, I really tried very hard, um, but ultimately it just was not what I wanted to learn. But I was just so young, I just didn't know. I mean, I was uh, 
let's see, how old was I when I, I, 20 when I went to them. It does take a while to come upon your own sense of style, um, the way you paint, what feels right on a personal level. Yes, I, I do think that's true because you, you can't, I mean, I was there for three years, but I actually am, was arguably worse when I left. You, know, you can't really learn it. And so, but the good thing was that they had both studied at the Art Students League in New York oh, there City. There you go. So they both came, that's where their training came from. And interestingly enough, they both had studied with uh, uh, Bridgman, George Bridgman. So if you know that name. I but, do know that name. So those famous books, George Bridgman, but they had actually studied with George Bridgman. So I had been studying drawing primarily with Edith and then painting with with Dick. And, and they, they really were a huge influence in terms of introduced me to the work of certain artists that, that were influential, like Walter Murch, if you've ever heard of him. He, he actually ended up, I think he was a, a professor up in, uh, at Boston University, I think. I don't know him, but... Yeah, well, they're interesting paintings, you know, very, um, I think, about edges, you know, still life, still life. Uh, also introduced us to the work of Priscilla Roberts, who was a friend of Richard and, and, and uh, Edith's. And she, she actually has a painting at the, in the permanent collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She, I, she might even still be alive today. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but, but very, very tight painter and, and was somebody that he really uh, admired. And, and I got something from her work as well. It's wonderful. And then they told me about the Art Students League and about David LaFell. So that's actually how I ended up going to uh, New York City. That's amazing. And so how long did you study there in New York City? Well, I was at the league for probably two and a half years, maybe three years, something like that. And then, and then I got my own studio. Oh, well, that's exciting, isn't it? So you really made a big leap. So big that, so first of all, why still life? Uh, your career obviously went from not sure what you were going to do to finding still life. And then did you immediately have a passion for that? Or did it, did everything just fall into place? How did that happen? Well, I mean, the one thing about still life is it's something you can do uh, quietly in your studio. <clears throat> and you don't have to pay any money for the model. <laughs> so, oh, there you, go. <laughs> you know, and back then, you know, money, money was certainly an issue. And so still I became the place where I could be quiet with the subject and actually really study it. I love still life. And uh, I, I like the control that I have in my studio with it. I get to play God. When you're outside, Mother Nature's in charge. And when you're inside the studio, you get to be in charge. And so um, you learned how to light and set up a still life. Are there any tips you could give our listeners uh, about setting up a still life that you've learned? Yes, absolutely. Well, the, uh, you know, it was interesting because when I studied with uh, Dick and Edith, there was uh, the last year I had kind of fallen out of favor with them both. And uh, I was just studying with Dick. And I think as punishment, he, <laughs> he was making it harder on me in terms of doing setups. So I would go for maybe six classes before he'd finally okay a setup, you know. But in the meantime, what was happening is that I was putting up objects and trying different backgrounds and trying different objects together. And so with, unbeknownst to me really at the time, I was learning how to do setups. I mean, that was kind of an interesting thing that happened. I mean, I was feeling a little bit mistreated at the time, but then, but once I went to New York City, I, I was actually able to do setups. I, I think that the one mistake a lot of people make is they don't spend enough time trying to set it up. You know, they just, they're so anxious to paint that they throw things up there and then just start painting. Well, there are all kinds of problems that ensue if you don't take the time to actually get a visual idea. You're so, your yeah. setups are so beautiful and everyone is so unique. And the objects you choose to put into your still life paintings are very interesting as well. And so I bet you have quite a collection of interesting objects. 
I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, do. I uh, found a few antique dealers in New York City and okay. so I bought quite a few things there. And I think that I'm so, um, I so love the, um, what time does to things. So I, I like old objects and the patinas and it, it's you know, just I, great. I agree. And they're a work of art in their, on their own. And it's fun mm -hmm. to translate that third dimension into two dimension and you do such a beautiful job I, I love the lighting and and everything you choose it's just such a sensitive way beautiful so some of your heroes obviously you are married to a famous artist I don't know if you want to share about that being married how you work together okay well um well obviously I, I moved to New York City to study with David so you know I, I had a short trip that I took with a friend of mine and once I took a couple of weeks from David, I knew he was the one I wanted to study with. So went home and then, you know, moved, moved back to New York City. So David really was my main teacher. And even though he wasn't teaching drawing, I also took my drawings to him too. And so he really became my drawing teacher as well as my painting teacher. So he, uh, his work was work that spoke to me in a way that really no other artist in history had. So I know that may seem like hyperbole, but it wasn't. Prior to finding David, it was a four month trip with a friend of mine, Dennis Parker. And uh, we went everywhere. We went to the American Academy. We went you know, as far north as that, and then all the way to the East Coast, all the way up the coast and down and all the art schools and galleries and museums and everything in between. And David's work was the work that spoke to me. Good to see you. I mean, isn't that crazy? Yeah, it was just, I mean, it's like how that could happen. So whether or not we ended up having a relationship, I knew he was my teacher. Yes. You know, it, it so happened that we just were in sync and somehow, you know, had some sort of ESP between us and it, it started right away. That's what's... That's you know, such a great story. Crazy. I love that. <laughs> and now you live in New Mexico. Do you share the same studio and work together? No, and, and no. that happened really early on that we separated. I think I only painted a couple of times with David in his studio, maybe, maybe. Um, and then I, I got my own studios. So I, that happened pretty, pretty quickly. I mean, uh, the leak is great because, you know, it can kind of be your studio in New York City. So it was my studio for a long time. And then after I, I left the leak, then I, I pretty quickly found a studio. So it was across uh, Union Square Park from David's studio. And, and do you then, critique each other's works uh, um, now to this day? How does that work out? Yeah, no, we, we do. And we have separate studios. So yeah, yeah. we definitely have separate studios. <laughs> Which is probably uh, a good thing. <laughs> we don't usually um, uh, volunteer a critique unless it's asked for. Okay. But every once in a while we, we do, you know, if we just feel there's something egregious that we really need to say. <laughs> right. Was, was, it, was there a time where you made that leap from being a student to where you're uh, respected on the same level as a professional and and was that a transition that happened slowly or how did that work out yeah that was the slow work. painful, <laughs> painful yes. yeah well because i think you know if you can imagine the difficulty i mean you know relationships are yes. challenging intimate relationships are challenging on their own but uh but to go from being teacher student to kind of peer colleague you know it, it it's it's taken a lot of years and a lot of adjustments but you know and rightfully so i i had to earn every bit of it so of course oh my goodness i can't even imagine how hard you've had to work so well and as you know women have to i think well, i was just going to say <laughs> Do you believe it's still a bit of a man's world out there? And or are we making some progress um, at the level that you're at? Are you feeling as though women are making great strides within the art world? There are so many wonderful female artists. Are they getting the recognition they deserve? Are we having to work harder to be seen and heard? Uh, or 
is the playing field being leveled a bit more? I think social media has helped a lot, actually, uh, and blogging and that sort of thing. So, which, which I know would be, you know, your expertise. I, I'm not not uh, quite as savvy in that world, but which makes it even more impressive, you know, that you've been able to separate yourself from the pack and do so well. Well, you know what? In in all fairness, I would say that when I started. Um, it, it was different in the sense that um, there weren't as many people painting. And so if you did become a good painter, you were noticed, you know, so Happy. now I don't think that's necessarily true. I think you could be a very good painter and not get noticed if you weren't doing all the social media. I think that there's truth to that. And that, that's what I like about social media. So <laughs> it, it is a good tool for us. I mean, I think, yes, I think everything is skewed in, in, in man's favor, in, in men's favor. I think, you know, that if you're a man, there's kind of an assumption that, you know, people will confer, they will confer uh, fame and all the things that come with that to a man just for being a man. And with a woman, I think you just have to fight every, you know, bit of the way. I mean, and I will say that over the years, I've gotten some really, really high compliments from men, but always in private. Oh. <laughs> they, they, they won't say it. They won't say it in public, but you hear it in private. So that speaks volumes. Well, that's too bad to hear. Goodness. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that it's, it's the yeah. truth. I mean, there was a time when I thought, oh, no, there isn't really a, a gender inequality. And I really have seen that it, it is, it's a real thing. It is a real thing. Do you sign your name? I, I should have looked, but do you sign your first name, Sherry McGraw? No, no, just McGraw. I don't know. Did that have anything to do for you with just being not a male or a female, just a beautiful painting in front of you? I, it, it, that isn't really why. I, it was really just for the aesthetics of it. Okay. McGraw looked better than S. McGraw. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But you know, when I was a, a student in the very beginning and I was, I was in the uh, Washington Square Outdoor Show, I don't know if you've seen it or heard of it. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it had been going on for a long, long time. David had actually shown in it, you know, years and years ago when he was just starting out. So it was kind of a nice way for people to, you know, artists to start out and start to make money. So invariably, um, people would come by and look at my work and ask me if I was sitting there for my boyfriend or was I sitting there for my father? <laughs> yeah. So that started really young. So how did you make that giant leap from good artist to the master that you have become? Uh, were, did it happen organically? Was it a conscious move that, you know, just the right choices? I mean, are there some tips to go from good to great to master? Well, I think, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it, it maybe a lot of it has to do with your intent, you know, and what you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why it's, you'll get what you want. So it's, it's really good to be very clear about what it is you do want. And what, what I wanted was I really wanted to have the understanding that the great artists that I admired had and had. That's what I always wanted in both drawing and painting. I really wanted to understand, I wanted to understand what they understood. And so that was always my intent. And to be honest, I never even really thought much about career. I, I was just glad that I could sell and I could keep going and keep learning. But, you know, as cliched or uh, as it might sound, it is really what I wanted. And so I think because of that, you make certain choices to get the thing that you want. So, you know, whatever it is that you do want, you know, if you want to be an illustrator, or if you want to, you know, just have a career and make a lot of money or, you know, but, but if you're clear about what you want, I mean, you will get that. You will get what you want. <laughs> now, I'm sure like the rest of us, you have had to deal with a lot of rejection in your life, correct? And correct. yes. So were there, as you were, getting to what you want. Did you deal with a lot of closed doors or rejection from 
competitions or exhibitions or did everything, did the golden gates just open up for you? Oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. It was it was difficult. It was difficult the whole way. That's like, inspiring for us to hear. But, you know, again, it's like, I think that the ones that really do well are the ones that love it. True. That's right. When you really love it, no matter what pain and disappointment and hard work and everything that you have to go through, it doesn't really feel bad because, I mean, as disappointing as things are and all of that, but it's like nobody could have uh, dissuaded me from doing this. And that's all it took. It wasn't like I was the most talented one. I wasn't. I mean, there were other people I grew up with that were had much more natural ability. I mean, so, I had ability, but. Oh, it sounds like, and, and a lot in your head. You're, I can tell you're very, very bright, <laughs> which will go to bright light in a moment, but. <laughs> But I want to ask you, because a moment ago you said that you were striving to understand what your mentors understood, what the greats understood. And I know that's hard because it's been so many years of understanding, but are there a few things that you could share right off the bat, like that are on the tip of your brain that, that you've understood the concepts that were so valuable to help with your art and your process of painting? drawing possibly or, or what are there a couple things you could share about what you've learned that the greats understood yes yes and and that it's a big subject yes it is a big subject. <laughs> a big subject well okay starting with drawing you know the the ones that i most love um the two top would i mean the the top one would be anthony van dyke and then and for a long time because you know i, I used to be a guard at the metropolitan museum of art i don't know if you knew that but, <laughs> no yeah, i did not I, know that i go from That's mom's really you know, library of books from the met and then i worked at the met oh wonderful yeah it was a great thing but um so i got to study these drawings up close which was really cool but uh i had seen some bad drawings by rubens and enough that it, I was really like holding Van Dyke, you know, who was Ruben's student, right? Yeah. So Van Dyke was his student. Uh, and I kind of held him, you know, in a higher position. But then I saw this one person show of Ruben's drawings at the Met. And after that, I was absolutely in awe of Ruben's as well. I mean, it just the, um, the humility that you wouldn't necessarily put with Rubens, but was in the in the drawing. So that that's part of it. It's that quality of of humility and study that these greats had in their drawing. They weren't trying to be um, glib. They weren't trying to impress anybody. They really drew to understand, and so it it gives a completely different quality. But but the thing that they have that they all had that I somehow clued into early because David had it too in his drawings is that, that the line is alive. Oh, I love that. That is beautiful. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> line is alive. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of people that can come out with results and come out with drawings that are impressive, but if, if the line isn't, uh, infused with that sense of trying to get the life life mm -hmm. on a paper if if that isn't there then the drawings don't have that energy they don't have that life oh that's I love that phrase that is beautiful and as you were telling me about viewing these drawings in my mind's eye before you use that phrase I was just thinking of the, the pressure that, you know, the, the lift and then push and, and just this lyrical line that is created. And I've seen that, by the way, you do capture that in your work and your drawings and you do beautiful figurative work. And, um, and so uh, thanks for sharing that little phrase. Now, mm -hmm. how do you translate that into paint? Okay, you know it's interesting because I can I can give you a a, a great example of of, of uh, seeing that so startlingly uh, exemplified. David had uh, you know you know the Velasquez painting Juan de Pereja. 
No, I'm gonna have Okay, to so it, it's it, but I so, can't so Velasquez painted his, I think, kind of manservant or something. Yes. Who was um, I think maybe African American. He's a very rich skin colored guy. It's one of his most famous paintings. And oh, it's in the and the originals at the Met. So, I mean, it was a painting I studied all the time. And so David told me that when he was a student, he had seen that painting, or what he thought was that painting, at the Hispanic Society in, um, in Harlem, in, in New York City. And later found out that that was a copy. Oh. But, he, but his memory was that it was so good he, he thought he really wanted to see it again. So we made arrangements with the director to go and see it. And so the guy took us through all these circuitous routes and finally we get up to this room and there are all these paintings and racks and everything. And he was kind of maybe 10 feet away and was pulling the painting out of a rack. And from 10 feet away, it was like, I knew it wasn't Velasquez. Okay. So then he shows us up close and the paint didn't have the energy that Velasquez had. It was a good copy. It was everything, but it didn't have his energy. And that's the thing also in painting that happens is that your intent gets into those brushstrokes. Absolutely. And, and do, you so, think, do you find that even a mood that you might be in a time in your life shows up in the painting itself as well? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you develop, your brushstrokes change. Right. It all has to do with, I mean, it's such an incredible thing when you think about what it is we can do, is that we can put something down on the canvas that hundreds of years from now, somebody could know who we are from our paint strokes. Oof, it's amazing isn't, isn't that it? wild and because yeah, i had studied Velasquez so intently he was really one of my big heroes you know from working at the met and i was you know would study his work but just the brevity and how much he could convey was so little was was incredible to me and but can you imagine that we can do that that we can make brush strokes and that hundreds of years later somebody can really know us because I feel like I know Rembrandt from studying his work. I know Velasquez. I know Rubens. I know Van Dyck. And it's because that is what is in their line, in their paint, you know, in their ideas, you know, everything. But it's, it's kind of a magical, incredible really thing. Is. And I'm just mesmerized by your words. You're very poetic. And, and then you're a very poetic thinker and painter and, and a wonderful teacher. And so it's just such an honor to chat with you. I'm so, I'm transfixed by your words. Um, so oh, you, thank you. Thank are you. a teacher and that leads us to Bright Light. Uh, can you tell a bit about how you've been transitioning from teaching in person, which you've done for years. In fact, I tried a couple times to get in some of your workshops. I know you've taught in Scottsdale before and they're always full. So maybe someday I'll make it into one, but but now yes. you're online. <laughs> Hopefully we get to go back to doing it personally. I know, exactly. Hopefully so. I'm, I'm optimistic. But um, <laughs> so you're online teaching now along with David LaFell. How did that come about? And would you like to share a bit about Bright Light? What is it? Bright Light Art? Fine Art. Uh -huh. Fine Art. Okay. Yeah, Bright Light Fine Art. Well, you know, uh, what was happening is that we were, in a sense, so in demand that we were and we had a hard time saying no. And so we ended up just doing so many workshops. It was taking us away from the studio. And so uh, our friend Jacqueline Kamen uh, came up with this idea essentially to start doing these videos and, um, and, and that's kind of how it began. So that we figured that we could reach more students and spend more time in the studio. So that's, that's actually how it began. And when did this begin? How long have you been doing this? I think it's been like six or seven years ago, maybe when oh, we started. Goodness. Wow, I didn't yeah. realize that. Well, it's a beautiful yeah. site and it is a lot of work, isn't it? To it's a lot of work. <laughs> online and to teach like that. And so how do you work that into your workflow? Uh, obviously we can't teach in person right now, so maybe that 
simplifies that aspect of your life. But uh, are you recording everything that you're doing in your studio these days? I mean, usually where we get the content for the, what we call the Artist Guild, that, mm -hmm. that is part of Bright Light Fine Art. So it's this uh, whole library of instructional videos. And we have, I think, somewhere around 100 videos in there, which is a lot of videos. That is. You know, done by David, by me, by Jackie, and now uh, her daughter, Stacy, who, who really is a very, very talented uh, girl. She, she's just so talented and does these amazing uh, interiors. So we're just starting to add her videos to the library. But, oh, that's great. Uh, but what we usually do is we tape them at workshops. So we get a lot of content from that. So, um, you know, we have this really terrific videographer who um, helped us do the 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 first e-course that we've done we're actually working on a painting e-course now that is primarily david but um because it's following his book and artist teaches but but i'm also doing a lot of the demonstrations you know because let, let's face it it's it, as you can imagine it's a lot of work to do one of these e-courses yeah and uh and so we did i think 90 videos for my drawing e-course so if you can imagine that was a lot of it oh my goodness <laughs> But, um, but it also followed my book. So w there are some videos that we create in our studio. We, we also have a, uh, a series that we call a day in the studio series, which is where we just film us painting or drawing in the studio. And then we do a voiceover later to say what we were thinking about. So it's kind of the closest to being in our studio, looking over our shoulder. I like you that know. approach. Instead of trying to talk while you're painting, which right. is a skill in itself and, it is. and it I'm is. sure you're very good at that because you teach in person a lot however this probably is more relaxed for you to be able to just paint and then do the voiceover later plus I mean we're we do them in such a way so that you really see the kinds of struggles that happen because I, I think that so often with a demonstration because you know you pretty much are doing something that you know you can do generally and uh, every demonstration seems to turn out and I think that for students it can be sometimes defeating because they start to think that every time they go to the easel they should be able to make a painting every single time so on this one day in the studio that I did I did this still life and it was a big still life of this big Venus statue you see me, you know, wipe it off and start it all over again because I didn't like the size and placement. And I really had gone, I think, two days on it and then oh. and wiped it off and started it again the third day. And you so, kept that in the course. for the kept, it, we kept it in there. Yeah. So because I think, that, yeah, it's important for people to see, well, first of all, how important it is to me to get the size and placement right. And then I'll do anything. I have to do destroy anything in order to make it as good as possible. That's a good quote too. <laughs> you know, we have morphed into a different, uh, a, a different membership, but now we have like a basic membership that is basically you, you get, you know, the artist guild, all the videos, and you also get David's Facebook videos because we're doing David on Sundays. He, he oh. speaks to the world. And I don't know if you've seen that yet, but it's, I'm going to look for that now. Okay. Yeah. It's 11 in, in the morning, uh, our time, mountain time. Okay. That's and, great. And on bright light, fine art, Facebook. Okay. Okay. Anyway. And so David, you know, he sometimes does demonstrations. He sometimes, you know, but he answers questions and we come up with ideas for programs and people, can write in and get answers during the program. So those are part of every level of membership that we have. But we have like, you know, basic, uh, professional and master level. So the master level gets absolutely everything that we've done, which is pretty comprehensive, <laughs> so. That is a lot of work. Six years is a lot. And are you on a WordPress site? Is that WordPress or what kind of platform are you working I on? I think it is WordPress. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then how do you host your videos? Is it through Vimeo? You, you have to make a lot of mistakes and, you know, and the people that you trust and I mean, you know, all of that. But yes, we've gone through a lot. <laughs> Jackie and I really are the two that, that run the company. Well, yes, now it is Vimeo. Uh -huh. It is, okay. So I, even figuring that out is hard, I think. I mean, I'm working on monetizing my blog in ways and I'll be selling some videos at some point. 
and just even making those choices, it's a lot to think about. It's confusing. So I admire you both for doing this. And, and David, of course, is the, uh, you know, just he <laughs> has such a huge fan base all over the world. So it, yeah. it does drive a lot of people there. So you are so successful. What kind of goals do you have ahead of yourself? I mean, do you feel like you've arrived artistically? Are you continually, continually striving to get better? Or are you comfortable where you are? How do, what happens next? That's a great question, Lori, really. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I just continually try to get better, you know, and so it's interesting that whatever level you're at and you think at that point, you think if I could just get here, I'd be happy. But what it takes to get there makes you want more. And so it's that journey, right? The journey, not the destination. Right, right. So I don't think about any one goal. I just, it's, it's just that, you know, you're inspired by people whose work you really love. And when you see qualities uh, in that work that you admire, it, you know, that is like, keeps raising the bar in terms of what, of what you want to achieve in your own work. Absolutely. Well, goodness, are there any last things you want to share with us? And uh, <laughs> where can we well, find you? And and let us know how to follow you. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you can definitely find me on uh, brightlightfineart.com. Okay. And, and then we also, uh, when we do give workshops, and we're thinking about doing some online workshops as well, uh, that's artistguildworkshops.com. Also, I just want to thank you because I think that this is uh, such a, I mean, you have such a wonderful spirit and also intelligence and curiosity and, uh, and, and you made this, this interview really fun. Oh, good. Well, I just am honored and you were so fascinating and I know everyone's going to enjoy learning more about you. So thank you for taking this time out of your busy day. Someday I hope to meet you in real life. And, and yeah. David, say yeah. hello. Thank you to you him. Have, you have a, an invitation to come to Taos. So. Oh my goodness, I would love that. Maybe I can sneak down to Taos. That would be fun. Okay. That's, <laughs> That's that wonderful. Really <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us uh, for the 2020 Club. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Lori.